everyone and welcome to another episode of the Read Right to Left podcast. I, as always, am G, joined by my wonderful co-host Ray from Whimsical Pictures. Hi guys! And it's the end of the year, December, and as always, Ray and I are going to be reflecting on our favourite new series from the year. Everything that was out of everything that we'd read that has been released in 2022 uh we've narrowed it down to our top five we try not to overlap too much so hopefully we'll be well we yes. will be talking about 10 different series today um we'll also spotlight some of your wonderful listeners favorite new debuts for the year and i'm sure we'll have a mm -hmm. bunch of honorable mentions and other asides along the way as well <laughs> absolutely <laughs> we've done a few of these before y'all know the drill <laughs> <laughs> pretty much so it's been a long year ray it's been a long year <laughs> and even more than that it's just been a absolute monster of a year for manga i don't know yeah how many new series came out this year but it's just <laughs> I don't want to think many. about it. <laughs> it's far too many. Um, and this is not even considering like the digital side of it. We have had so many um, like chapter new debuts on services like Azuki and Shonen Jump. It's just been there's just so much. There's so much. <laughs> so and... much all the time. <laughs> and on top of this we've also seen so many delays such as still supply chain and COVID impacts in the publishing sector paper shortages um it's just been kind of a rough time um as a manga fan because yeah. there's a level of needing or wanting to get something immediately as it's released otherwise you're going to be waiting yeah. months and months and then mm -hmm. also with 40,000 new books coming out every month. How do you choose? What do you choose? <laughs> For all of yeah. these new series that you know nothing about, how do you narrow it down? Um, uh... <laughs> oh, it's man. overwhelming. Yeah. Let me tell you, um, especially with like having been in Japan still for the first half of the year, Mm -hmm. and all of my moving expenses, moving halfway around the world. Um, I definitely, like, was not up on my manga reading this year mm -hmm. at all. And uh, so it's been, uh, it has been a journey trying to just catch up <laughs> in time for this podcast um, in the last month or so. So... <laughs> <laughs> Even even myself, who has well, I've had some pretty large expenses, <laughs> house ownership, um, but <laughs> I can't say I had the stress of a international move. And even so, yeah. it's just been so many books, so little time. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and the thing but... is as well is we've seen so many. Like, looking to next year, there's so many other books <laughs> exciting to come out. Yes, and that is the thing, is that a lot of these are really exciting books. We've gotten so many things that I see coming up on these new, like, license lists mm -hmm. that I'm, like, never would have imagined in a million, billion, trillion years mm -hmm. would get an English release. And some of these we have in their entirety now, yes. uh, as of this year, and it's absolutely insane. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> things that have been, like, long shots of long shots on my lists of, like, wanted licenses mm -hmm. are out now, and it's, like, you can have them in print, and it's crazy. You can turn them and turn the page and read at your leisure and put it down and come back to it and just say, oh my god, it's here, and it's, it's in real. English and everything. <laughs> you can put it down and come back to it and it's still there. 
It's not a dream. <laughs> And yeah, it just, the manga industry, the manga community just seems to continue to grow at an exponential pace, right? Um, the smaller publishers, uh, some of our, our long-standing favorites like Starford Books and Glacier Bay Books have re- oh my gosh, um, mm-hmm. their, their current releases and their future, their announced titles um, I can't, it's amazing. Honestly, we're living mm-hmm. in a very interesting world when it comes to manga. Um, Indeed. And before we jump right into our favorites of the year, was there any uh, honorable mentions that you wanted to touch on before we start our deep dive? Yeah, uh, I got a few. First Mm -hmm. of all, just want to give a quick shout out to a couple series that I finished this year. One Mm. of them finished in English this year. One of them did not, but I finished it in Japanese this year and Mm -hmm. I wanted to shout it out because it was on our list last year. Mm -hmm. Um, And that one is My Love Um, Mm Mix-Up. It had one volume out last year when we talked about it. Yeah. Um, it since has a lot more, like five or something, five or six. Yeah. And it did complete in Japan this year as well. It also has very cute drama adaptation, live action. Um, that is adorable. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but I did finish this one in Japan um, this year, and it continues to be right up to the end, a strong recommendation for me. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to give the update on that one. Um, the strong premise that it sets up in the first volume, it keeps on going with that and doesn't let you down. It's great. Um, and the other one is, of course, because I am myself, I have to, in every podcast episode, remind everyone that volumes one and two of the Poe Clan are available from Fantagraphics right now, (laughs) so... (laughs) It did finish uh, this year with the second half of the original run of the series. We continue to be promised the sequels at some unknown date in the future. Uh, But you can consider the series complete with the two volumes that we have gotten. That's all of the Poke Land that existed for like several decades. Um, And this second book does include several of my absolute favorite Poke Land stories. So... Just wanted to shout that one out as well. Um, But yeah, honorable mentions. Uh, Well, I wanted to shout out um, a digital only release uh, Mm -hmm. from a creator who I am positive will show up uh, later in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, One, Yuki Kamatani, who uh, viewers of our podcast will know. We are both huge fans of, we've done a dedicated episode on Yuki Kamatani, as well as another episode on one of their series. Um, Nobody knows. We got two series from them this year, uh, one of which is the digital only release of their two volume series, Hirayeth, The End of the Journey, Mm -hmm. um, which was prematurely ended. So it doesn't really have a conclusion, which is unfortunate. But the two volumes that we do have are extremely strong. Um, This is about uh, sort of a girl who is feeling suicidal after the untimely death of her best friend. When she is rescued from, basically she jumps in front of a truck and is rescued by a mysterious man who is the, pushes her out of the way and is then hit by the truck, but does not die because he is in fact immortal. Um, and he is accompanied by a mysterious figure claiming to be a kami, a god. Um, and the two of them are on a journey to the underworld of Yomi, which is said to be located in Shimane Prefecture. So it's sort of a a road trip series as the girl decides to accompany them. 
And we just have these three very uh, charming um, characters with a lot of really charming banter between them. We have a lot of musing on the nature of death, the meaning of life, and what it means to fear death. Mm -hmm. Um, Which I feel like are things that have been in the background of plenty of Kamatani's other work, especially Nabari no O. Um, But we see it much more brought to the forefront in this series. And I wish we could have seen more of what they had in mind for this series, but unfortunately we do only have the two volumes. Mm -hmm. But they're well worth a read. I agree. Hiraith is is one of my, especially digital debuts for this year. Um, We got, again, so much much manga um, was released and on digital platforms as well as just in physical print. Um, as long time, a long time fan of, of Kamatani's work, it was sort of a no brainer that I would be reading this. It was, is fantastic and is well worth looking at for those who are a fan of this creator's work or Bray's wonderful, wonderful summary if it, if it has piqued your interest. Yes. Uh, do you have any runners up? I do. Um, so in addition to Hiraith and, and your wonderful explanation, um, I also wanted to, so for those long time listeners, um, I kind of put a little bit of a self imposition when I'm making the decision for my top five, I tend to look at print only or print releases, not digital only releases. I tend to um kind of veer away from omnibus like i i like it to be kind of continuing these are my own restrictions i'm placing upon myself they don't necessarily make sense but because of that (laughs) i do have a couple titles that were released this year um that i absolutely adore one that is kind of a follow-up from our discussion on it last year which was the print release of look back um Mm -hmm. which have i didn't read this year i read last year but i do think that for those who haven't read uh tasuki fujimoto's phenomenal single volume about two girls and their art absolutely check it out um it was it's nice to see more and more of fujimoto's one shots and like single volume books making the transition to print where we will be seeing uh, Goodbye Airy this coming year and we have a couple short story collections from him as well. Uh, all very exciting mm-hmm. for fans, <laughs> including myself. Um, but I also <laughs> wanted to highlight that we phenomenally got a um, Daisuke Igarashi book, which is this year, um, which was just mm-hmm. amazingly good, uh, fantastic collection of short stories of witches from various different cultures with various different motivations and personalities um having been a fan of children of the sea the other work of his from uh that we have available in english uh when seven seas announced this one i was just gobsmacked uh and it did not (laughs) did not let me down it's beautiful, ethereal, definitely one to keep an eye out for if you haven't tried it. And of course, also, we got the omnibus or complete edition of The Music of Murray from Usumara Furia, which um, is mm. very exquisitely twisted in the way that Furia loves to be. <laughs> Um, it is a phenomenal series about love and devotion and dedication and the various types of ways that that can express itself. But also there's, it's reflecting on humanity and kind of the cost of independence and rationality um, and questions about 
all sorts of things, religious devotion. Um, wonderful, wonderful one and done book from One Piece Books. It is a two volume omnibus, so you do get the whole story in that single volume about a boy who uh, can hear the song, the music of Murray, who he sees as a giant clockwork angel in the sky. Um, he who he understands is God or is mm -hmm. a God um, and he's the only person who can see Murray who can hear Murray who can um, kind of understand her role uh, despite living in a fairly simple and devout um, community and his friendship and ongoing relationship with his female childhood friend um, it's, it's very, very good, and it not, there's, it, I mean, it's for you, there's a, there's a twist and a half, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah, if you are a fan of Furia's stuff, it isn't as dour, um, or as nihilistic as some of his works, it does, I'm not to say it doesn't have elements of that, but it's not, it's not overwhelmingly... You know, it's not no longer human, let's just say. Um, <laughs> few things <but> yeah. are. <laughs> A few things <laughs> are, and we can't really blame Foria for that one. Uh, <laughs> speaking of speaking of which, guess what's back in print? You can get No Longer Human from Isamaru Furia now if you want. There you go. Uh, yeah. It's been out of print forever. <laughs> forever. You, if you were someone wanting to read that absolute soul destroying um, <laughs> story and could couldn't afford the three volume incredibly out of print release from vertical they well they vertical slash kodansha has re-released it in an omnibus um there you go oh i also want to just quickly also um say changes of heart which is i think is digital only. It's been released by Kodansha. It's an eight volume series. I think it's actually finished in English now. Um, but it it started it also debuted this year in English. Um, I'm a big sucker for childhood friend romance um, adults and it, it it's exactly what that is and I'm just so it was specifically made for me um and it's it is really good if you're a fan of like adult romance without a huge amount of like overall drama uh if for if you like reading about a couple who like understands each other and actually communicates and actually like has really good chemistry um check it out <laughs> okay um and i guess i'll go through the rest of my runners up mm. altogether if that's okay Mm -hmm. um along that same line uh this one is definitely a smuttier title mm -hmm. um which i think is in seven seas like ghost ship or whatever they're like mature their new one the one that's like mature Steam ladies Steam comics ship. Steam ship. steamship because it's steam steamship <laughs> okay um uh this is ladies on top which mm -hmm. uh, is exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is about a woman who has had a sort of not a whole lot of luck in the romantic department, specifically because she is super turned off by guys trying to dominate her in bed. Um, she doesn't like having the guy on top. She doesn't know why. Um, and then we have her dating a guy who, when they get into the bedroom, it turns out he's having similar problems, but the opposite way around. He feels he's super self-conscious in the bedroom and feels just super uncomfortable being on top, being in the mm -hmm. lead. He would rather mm -hmm. somebody be in the lead for him. Um, and... So, uh, after some fumbling around blindly, they mm -hmm. eventually realize that they are 
perfectly compatible for each other. What she's always <laughs> wanted is to be on top, to be dominating. Um, and what he has always wanted is to have a girl dominate him and to be the little pillow princess of his dreams. <laughs> and um, it's them sort of navigating navigating um, their sexual relationship um, and the various like challenges that come with sort of not um, fitting into the extremely conventional, uh, sexual mm -hmm. dynamics that are expected by society, especially on the part of the guy. Um, he has got a lot of sort of mental blocks going on where he feels like he's a failure as a man, mm -hmm. um, that he has to do things a certain way or, you know, his girlfriend's going to run away from him eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the end of the day, this is just a really sweet, like, spicy kind of romance um i have read more of this in japanese since um because i wanted to see where it was going to continue to go mm -hmm. i'll say volume two or something has a scene that made me really uncomfortable in terms of not involving the main girl but there is a scene of sort of sexual assault by a woman of a man that is mm -hmm. super uncomfortable and not treated the best, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but everything I've read since then, it continues to be just super cute. So <laughs> um, I really like this main couple. I think they're fun. I like the girl. I like the guy. I think he's adorable. So. <laughs> he's very cute. He has big doe <laughs> eyes, I swear. The and the <laughs> He's blush. so blushy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say this feels very much like if you read the author's notes, the author says, like, you know, I was just like curious about exploring an unconventional relationship type. Mm -hmm. Um, this does not really feel like a story that is necessarily it does feel like it's from someone who has done a lot of research. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't feel like it's necessarily from someone who has the kink that the characters yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, to talk about another series I enjoyed <laughs> by someone who I think does have this kink. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Yakuza Fiance. <laughs> 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 Uh, this is from the creator of, is it Haru's Curse? Is that the name of yes. it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I believe showed up as a runners-up on our list last year. Um, that is a very strong one-shot that I highly recommend. Um, dealing with grief and death of a loved one and moving on. Uh, this one is not that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh this one is about the granddaughter of a Kansai, so Osaka, a uh, Yakuza boss who gets sort of suckered by her grandfather into, well, sold basically yeah. <laughs> into uh, being the fiance of the grandson of a major Yakuza boss in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Um she goes there to meet this guy and, you know, the, our first impressions of her are that she's very pragmatic, that she's just very normal, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. um, very confused by this whole thing, doesn't know what's going on. She meets this guy uh, who, you know, his looks, he looks very normal and mild-mannered, but she quickly discovers that there's something very off about this young man. Oh, oh, oh boy. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, Sir. Sir. And we, we get, like, the whole first half of the book is just her getting increasingly unsettled by this man and his unrelenting, empty smile. Mm. <laughs> 
Um, and we're like, okay, there's something big that is wrong with this man, but what is yeah. it? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, you have the scene where he comes home, like, late at night, and she catches him coming home, and he's covered in blood, and she's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I thought I thought that he was like me, he's not like Yakuza, he's like, you know, Yakuza in name only. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she catches him with his shirt off and he's got the full back tattoo and sleeves. <laughs> and she's like, oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. And um, at one p- at some point, he's finally like, I can't do this anymore. And then like goes on this whole diatribe about how she's so fucking boring and what he wanted was a spoiled little Yakuza princess to ruin his fucking life. <laughs> to fucking treat him like dirt. And and he's so keen. So keen. And so he, like, basically kicks her out, and she's like, I'm not going... Like, she has a pep talk, for, talk from her grandfather that's basically like, you're not coming home for a year because you need to ruin that man's life and let him know what you, what he did to you. (laughs) And she's like, why are all the men in my life terrible? (laughs) Just the worst kind of people. But then we have a beat and she comes into school like two weeks later and they're like talking about how she disappeared for two weeks. And she like shows up because he literally told her, that if she's not going to be useful to him as an interesting fiance, then she should just go work for a brothel and make some money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she comes back after two weeks to high school because both of these people are in high school somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. And just like drops a sack of money on his desk. And she's like, you want money? You wanted me to sell my body? Well, there you go. One kidney. (laughs) (laughs) And then she, like, her face just, like, turns into this, like, horrible scowl. And she starts Mm. just, like, verbally, like, tearing him to shreds. And he's like... This is exactly what I wanted. Marry me now. Ruin my life. Yes. Immediately just the biggest turn on that boy. He's just like, yes. This is what I want. Complete 180. I I will be Um, devoted to you my entire life. Please. Please talk back to me uh, more. (laughs) And of course, we have the implication at the end of the uh, volume as we see these two sort of, they're not seeing each other yet. She doesn't like him yet, but mm-hmm. like we can see how the dynamic is establishing itself and how they are definitely going to be like made for each other mm-hmm. um, in the most like sick and twisted way. <laughs> um but we also get the setup of, you know, what is going to be, like, a, I think a pretty standard, like, Yakuza, like, mystery type of plot. Mm-hmm. Um, with a string of murders, we don't know who's responsible for them, but clearly there's something big shaken up in the Yakuza world. And the two of them are going to have to face it together. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. There's something about this mangaka's work that is just, like, infectiously readable. Mm -hmm. no absolutely Um, it was such a fun volume I know this series has like won Konomanga ga sugoi or whatever Mm -hmm. Um, it's got awards Um, and yeah I'm not usually one for Yakuza stories I've talked about how they make me very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. but I think the reason that this one didn't is actually spelled out in the author note at the end where Mm -hmm. the author is specifically like I really like how campy the Yakuza are in western movies Uh (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was like that's why that's probably Mm -hmm. why it doesn't strike me as mm, not my thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, but 
Yeah, so I had a lot of fun with this one. Almost put it on my top five, but I ended up uh, switching it out for something else at the last minute. Mm. But uh, I am looking forward to more very much. <laughs> yeah, this for me, uh, this is one that I just, I only got the first volume a couple days ago. So that was one that I, I read in the couple days prior to this recording. And I already had my mm-hmm. my set my five set. Uh, I, they're pretty solid, but this one is absolutely a really great time. It's been highly requested. It, as you said, has won a bunch of awards, and you can really understand why. It is just that infectiously good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Just a couple more titles to mm-hmm. rattle off quickly. Uh, one that we talked about pretty much in depth in our memoir manga uh, episode, if you want to hear more about this, but this mm-hmm. is My Brain is Different, yes. Stories of ADHD and Other Developmental Disorders. Uh, it's probably my favorite book that I read for that, um, mm-hmm. one of them at least. Uh, this is a series of uh, short stories that are uh, biographical, basically, Um, The author went and talked to a lot of different people who uh, have ADHD, uh, learning disabilities, or other developmental disorders. Um, OCD. Was OCD the other one that it deals with primarily? Yes, yeah. Uh, And she writes about her own experience in one of those chapters, and then each other chapter is a different person's experience who she's talked to. Uh, This is just very empathetic, very well-researched, very sort of Mm broad-reaching exploration of, you know, uh, a lot of different experiences dealing with uh, these particular types of disorders, what it's like to grow up in the Japanese educational system with these Mm -hmm. disorders, what it's like to be diagnosed as a child, what it's like to be diagnosed as an adult. Um... You know, it deals with people who are from different economic circumstances. Um, And it is just, I mean, I think it's worth reading for anybody, but Mm -hmm. particularly if you have ADHD, OCD, or any kind of like learning disability or developmental disorder, um, I think you will find echoes of your own experience here. I certainly did um, as someone with ADHD. And I think it is well worth the read. Another one I wanted to mention is uh, a really high profile release from this year, which was Yokohama Kai Dash Kiko, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. which is like the er Iashk series yes. um, that yeah, people yeah. have been clamoring for for literal decades. Um, And we kind of thought we were never going to get, but uh, I was eager to check this one out because people have been raving about it for so long. Uh, For me, I was like, it's fine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, The issue, the big issue here is that the print quality is not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, It's ugly frankly. Um, And there are comparison images of what the Japanese books versus what we got uh, looks like online. And it really is not like it's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, But in terms of the story itself, I definitely see why a lot of people really love this. It's got a sort of sweet melancholic vibe to it. It's about an android in a post-apocalyptic version of Japan that has sort of returned to a sort of pastoral, like, small-town uh, way of living. Mm-hmm. Um, so the main character, the android Alpha, runs, like, a little tiny cafe in the small country town that used to be Yokohama. Mm -hmm. Um, but is now just mostly in ruins, like, is now a coast, um, because, like, the water levels have risen a lot, Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
she's sort of waiting on the return of her creator who left her a long time ago and probably isn't coming back. Um, and I think she kind of knows that, but she hopes anyway. And other than that, it's just her sort of vibing with the people from her town and some of the other like androids who come to visit her and the strange entities that have appeared in the wake of this apocalypse. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's calming vibes. Um, it's going to be sort of your mileage will may vary whether you find this charming and soothing or just boring. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, for me, I was, I don't know, somewhere in the middle, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, I probably won't be reading more, but I definitely wanted to mention it um, because I think it's worth a mention. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm of a similar mindset to you in regards to, uh, regardless of the actual print quality and issues that Seven Seas seem to have had with that at least first book. I don't know how subsequent books have gone. Um, looking at it and as a very formative Yashike, you can understand as you said, how it got so popular, it has really sets the tone for what a lot of series would copy in the coming years. As someone who has read a lot of those following series, um, I find that now there's a lot of Iyashike to enjoy <laughs> of all sorts of varieties um, and to mm -hmm. all various levels of quality. There's nothing bad or wrong with this series, but it does feel very early to the genre, mm -hmm. obviously, because it, yeah. it, it created the genre, <laughs> <laughs> or for the most part. Um, so yes, it. if you are very familiar with this style of story, it might not be like this, you know, the smash hit that you inherently want it to be. I look at Arya in the same way, um, mm -hmm. but that isn't to diminish what it is, is popularity, mm -hmm. its influence, and its importance, and just the, the very cool fact that we do actually have this now in English in some capacity. Although, again, mm -hmm. English books have a little asterisk because they're not nearly to the quality that they should be. Yeah, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, I have one more title that I wanted to mention as a runner-up. Yeah. Um, we got quite a few, like, of the horror manga masters in English mm. that um, I, you know, wasn't really expecting to get ever again in English. Um, but, uh, here we are incredibly blessed, um, and you will see that reflected in my list, of course, but the one that didn't quite make it into the top five, but is still very much worthy of a mention, uh, to me is Be Very Afraid of Kanako Inuki. <laughs> um, uh, so Kanako Inuki, again, is a sort of classic of the horror manga genre, Specifically shoujo horror manga, which um, mm -hmm. is a huge thing. Junji Ito does like shoujo horror. Uh, Tomie is shoujo horror. Uh, Kazuo Umez, of course, is a classic shoujo mangaka. Um, and Kanako Inuki as well. This is a collection of stories from, I think, throughout her career. Um, sort of meant as a best of. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, despite, like, the fact that there's probably more, like, gross out and body horror than you would find in a typical Goosebumps book, I would describe mm -hmm. this as very Goosebumps adjacent <laughs> horror. Um, she's very much, like, trying to find things that will spook and scare, uh, little girls, mm -hmm. um, especially like elementary school age girls, I would say older elementary school. Um, 
And I found all of these horror stories to be super charming. <laughs> uh, they have a great sense of humor to them. Mm -hmm. uh, her art style is very unique um, and sort of off-putting. <laughs> Everyone's and, gremlins. Uh, they're all gremlins. All those they're children. all gremlins. They're <laughs> like gremlin dolls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I thought this was super cute. I think that I would have loved this book as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked how like heartwarming some of the story's conclusions were. Um, mm -hmm. especially like the one about the two sisters, the older sister who bullies the younger one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I really loved that story. Um, basically in that one, the younger sister is super sad because no matter what she asks for for Christmas, her older sister always breaks it to torment her. <laughs> um... <laughs> So she makes a wish to Santa uh, that he'll get her something that her older sister absolutely cannot break. And so for Christmas from Santa, she gets a voodoo doll of her older sister. <laughs> <laughs> but then this one like takes a turn and is actually super heartwarming in the end. <laughs> um, and I really <laughs> enjoyed it a lot. So... Also, Kaneko Inuki uh, has a list of her top five manga that, like, changed her way of seeing the world or something. And number one on that list was The Poe Clan by Moto Hagio. So, <laughs> um, and she makes a comment that I, like, highlighted and sent to G, like, relatable content. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where she's, like, she went to an autograph session of Moto Hagio after having read the Poe clan and she was like so excited she couldn't sleep the night before and she still remembers how soft and cool her hands were. <laughs> I'm like, well, the woman's got taste, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's fantastic a little collection of stories. Certainly my favorite thing for Halloween reading this year. Alrighty, and without further ado, shall we get into the top five? Absolutely. Yeah, Drum roll, so please. <laughs> Alright, G, do you want to go with your number five first? Sure. Um, as always, I'm very, like, it doesn't, my top Two are normally like very strong. The others can go slot in wherever. Um, but my number five for this year, um, is one that was like, oh, if if somebody sat down, and was like, gee, we're wanting to make a manga that is a hundred percent your shit. What does it need to include? And we want to make it like we know you have all of these things that you enjoy. Um, and so just, what are you, what are you missing? What do you need more of? And they sat me down and I would say, oh, I want this, this, and this. And then that manga would turn into Lost Lab London by Shima Shinya. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for those who aren't aware, this is a Yen Press release. It's a three volume series. We have two volumes out currently from Yen. And uh, this is a, a British murder mystery um, mm -hmm. about a boy, or, well, a boy, a young man, a university student called Ari, who, um, well, Al, who one day he's on the tube going home from uni. It's just about the Christmas break. Um, and he gets off and just like goes home, doesn't, isn't really focused on anything. He's just thinking about, you know, finals and he's a very particular personality. He, he will do his friends assignments for them if they pay him. Like he's very transactional, um, but just mm -hmm. kind of normal guy. He is also, I must, um, note, um, South Asian. So not a hundred percent sure, like it's not 
immediately said in dialogue, but probably Indian um, background, mm -hmm. but he's also adopted. So he's been adopted his whole life, um, but, you know, obvious, obviously is not white. His adoptive parents are. That does, I am bringing this up for a reason. Anyway, so he gets back to his his apartment. He shares it with, you know, a share mate or a flatmate. Um, but when he mm -hmm. gets back, he hears on the TV that the mayor of London was stabbed and ultimately died on the tube. And uh, it was actually on when in the same train car that he was in or the subway car, I should say. Uh, so the police are looking for, you know, potential witnesses. They're trying to find out who murdered the mayor. Who murdered the mayor? Why mm -hmm. would they murder him? He's very popular, um, very liked. Mm -hmm. um, and so Al Alice is like, wow, that's weird. Uh, that uh, Surely not. Uh, he goes and he puts his hand in his pocket, in his out jacket pocket, overcoat pocket. And he finds the murder weapon. He finds the knife, the bloody <laughs> knife, and freaks out because, mm -hmm. like, he didn't, like, that's wild. Um, anyway, so he's like, holy shit, I have this murder weapon. The police are looking for it. I don't know anything about this. And I've touched this murder weapon. Like, nobody's going to believe me that I said, you know, I, it wasn't me because what? Like, my, I've touched it. My fingerprints are on it. I just, this is crazy. Um, and so, he just freaks out for a little while. Anyway, so obviously the police are on the case. Um, mm -hmm. And are not... I do appreciate the series, and I appreciate the... It's very British in that it is not inherently copaganda. The police can be very bad at their jobs, and a big part of the series is the inherent bigotry within the police, uh, both internally mm -hmm. and externally. So I'm not going to say, like, if you have issues with positive police p portrayals, I get it. This is not, it's not like just, oh, cops are brilliant. They're the best. Anyway, regardless, <laughs> we're, we're summarization of the story. Um, we have a detective, Detective Ellis, who has been put onto the case. He's been off duty for a little while. He's sustained an injury. He is also a minority. He's of African background descent. Um, and his like very close coworker, who's kind of the, a more senior detective, um, she's Asian. Uh, and the re again, the reason I bring this up is because they're kind of the only minorities within their station. Um, so they're very close. They don't really, I mean, they, they get the crap from everyone else. So mm -hmm. the, the whole suite, the whole station is doing a sweep, trying to find people. Um, they've got, you know, CCTV footage and whatever else. So they're looking for people who are on the train at that time. And Detective Ellis just so happens to be the one assigned to find Al, to, to get his statement, to see if he knows anything, if he was a witness, whatever. Anyway, so he, he rocks up to this apartment and Al is pretty straightforward. He's like, I found, you know, this is, he's freaking out, but he's like, I have the knife. I didn't have anything to do with it. I don't know why any like why anyone would do this i don't know if they're trying to just frame me because the police will always be like oh yes a minority they probably did it and so detective ellis having seen having seen that sort of bigotry before having had a suspect not turn out very an innocent suspect um just get dogpiled by the police and the uh, judicial system is like committed to help this kid out so the two the two team up to try and solve this mystery and as to mm -hmm. who killed the the mayor um who why why would they try to frame this innocuous 
uh, university student, was it purposeful that he was the one chosen to put the murder weapon on, plant the murder weapon on? Um, we also later, like, the the roommate of our main character, he ends up dying. Um, there's, there's stuff happening, so they're trying to figure out not only, like, the murder of the mayor, but why Al is involved in this, and also Al's background, um, his parentage because they may be closer than all these things are um it's not like i say this as someone who is pretty well versed in like murder mystery i've had a lifetime of it i'm not gonna say this is like the most difficult mystery um to figure <laughs> out but i really really like the character dynamics i also really appreciate how real London feels like the I I feel like Shima Shinya and I don't know this for sure but I feel like Shima Shinya definitely has lived and or worked in the UK because it doesn't feel like like a European setting you normally see in manga um it's not just like the white brigade, like everybody's blonde and blue eyed and whatever. Um, <laughs> it it talks about the inherent class and racial divides between people that are still, you know, very prominent within British society. It talks about the corruption of all of these systems and the inherent racism that are ingrained in them. It just feels really like true to life. Um Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I really, 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 really enjoy this. And although I've, like, I don't think the mystery is one that's too hard to solve. I don't know. Maybe I'm biased because I know a lot of this sort of stuff. I also love the art style. Um, if you've not read or seen any of Shima Shinya's works, it's very evocative of someone like Natsume Ono. Very stylized, but mm -hmm. expressive. Um, I just love the way that they draw eyes and just, they're, all of their characters are very distinct looking. Um, it's not hyper-realistic, it's not overly busy with framing either. It honestly, reading this, it's kind of like sitting down and watching a couple episodes of your favourite, like, British detective series. Um, it's very, <laughs> which for me is like, wow, this manga was made for me. <laughs> um, and so I had high hopes for this series. It honestly actually exceeded them, um, from the very beginning. I think both Detective Ellis and Al are very likable characters and it, yeah, it addresses a lot of just larger larger themes that can very often get muddled and lost when we are consuming media about you know the judicial system about law enforcement about whatever else um it it has more of a focus of the broader picture and doesn't shy away from the very sad unfortunate truth of like racial bias and well racism that goes that is inherent to a lot of these kinds of cases and so yeah lost lad london yeah it's good <laughs> i read the first volume of this in preparation for the podcast um mm -hmm. even knowing it wasn't probably going to be my thing um mm -hmm. as someone who is kind of allergic to British detective shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I did enjoy the volume for what it was, and I just wanted to echo what you said about the art. Um, very beautiful art in this, and I particularly like the use of the color gray. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just black, white, and screen tone, but this person, this artist, really uses gray. Um not just for shading, but for contours as well. Um, and it gives it a very almost painterly quality that mm -hmm. I haven't really seen in anything else. And I enjoyed that quite a bit. 
my number five uh, is Common Rider, <laughs> the classic manga collection by Shotaro Ishinomori. Um, yeah, so I did not read the Go Ranger book that we got. I just, it didn't interest me as much, mm -hmm. but I am so incredibly thrilled that we're getting more Ishinomori in English. Um, we, like, we got a little bit of Cyborg 009, like, back in the early days of mm -hmm. manga mm -hmm. uh, publishing in the West, but um, that's been out of print for so long <laughs> i think most people don't realize that it ever even happened um so and we've never had common writer okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and considering how many like common writer series and like tokusatsu series we get from discotech um it's kind of crazy that we haven't had the manga but i also understand why but also we have it now <laughs> 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 um and it is what it says on the tin it is common writer is one of the most famous like superheroes in japanese pop culture uh he's a cyborg who gets transformed into like a like he starts off as a human and then he gets abducted by the evil organization shocker mm -hmm. who turn him like replace everything in his body except for his brain um turning him into a cyborg with mutant bug powers um that are more grasshopper based as opposed to spider based as we may be more accustomed to in the u.s mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um and fortunately, he's able to get away from this evil organization before they reconstruct his brain into a remote-controlled brain that um, blindly follows the will of Shocker, who are trying to take over the world. Um, and he decides that he's going to use his cyborg powers for good in order to stop um the evil plans of Shocker, which don't just involve taking over the world, but also involve uh, toxic waste pollution and environmental stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because this series is from 1971. <laughs> <laughs> um, this uh, thousand page omnibus covers the entire original 1971 world run of the series um and i was excited about this because mostly because i desperately want to read more by this creator mm -hmm. um he is sort of the other guy when you're talking about osamu tezuka the other guy you're talking about is Shotaro Ishinomori. These are two yeah. people who are brought up in the same conversation, in the same sentence together. Um, Tezuka famously was incredibly jealous of Ishinomori's um, artistic achievements. Um, and Ishinomori famously was a hermit, mostly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's, he's a weird hermit man. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh but, yeah, uh, he's also the father of, you know, as we call Tezuka, the godfather of manga. Ishinomori is the godfather of tokusatsu. Um, he created the Power Rangers. He created Kamen Rider. Um, tokusatsu, as it is now, exists because of him. Mm -hmm. um, but talking about what I like about this series because the plot itself is incredibly stock standard. Like it's exactly what you expect. Like there's no surprises mm -hmm. here. It's, it's just common writer, <laughs> but Oh my God. Ishinomori is such an incredible artist. Mm -hmm. It's insane. <laughs> 
it is insane how good this man is at making comics. <laughs> um, it's just exhilarating. It's like I was reading through the book and the story's like, whatever, it's Common Rider. I'm having a good time. But it's like every other page, I would turn the page and just come across like the sickest comic book spread that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was just like incredible that this kind of layout um these kinds of techniques were being used by him like so early on like he really revolutionized manga as an artistic format mm -hmm. and like for me like all of my absolute favorite manga creators um Hagio included of course like they all have like their pet like Shotaro Ishinomori one shot that mm -hmm. just like changed their entire life <laughs> um and so it just means a lot to me to be able to like read his comic books in English mm -hmm. um and I I had to put it on the list um yeah it's just uh, as a as a known art appreciator, I just really loved reading this, <laughs> and I hope it paves the way for maybe getting more of Ishinomori stuff in English because mm -hmm. I would love to see more of his more like experimental stuff and not just his tokusatsu com content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been really. I'm like out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> it's been really interesting seeing the amount of. Well, just the amount of, and we could always use more, but the amount of classic manga that has finally returned or, or been released for the first time in English, um, the idea that these sorts of creators and content or comics of this age shouldn't or doesn't have a enough interest to be viable people aren't wouldn't be interested in it i'm so glad to see changing and to have such a tentpole of like what manga is like ishinomori finally available multiple of his series finally available is actually mm -hmm. just kind of real just really amazing insofar as this this is kind of the perfect example of how the manga market has changed since the last i guess boom of manga back in the the 2000s the the idea mm -hmm. that there is an audience for these sorts of comics the fact that companies aren't inherently allergic to anything over 5 years old yeah it's it's quite <laughs> quite interesting and um yeah Kamen Rider is a fun time <laughs> <laughs> it sure is all right and before we get into our number fours uh I think I'd like to read out uh one of the lists that we got from our viewers mm. um so uh we have from at manga mango man one <laughs> Uh, the Music of Marie, Yokohama Kaidashikiko, Danda Dan Sakamoto Days. Also, they mention Akane Banashi on Manga Plus. Um, and they also want to shout out uh, Blue Box and Hunter's Guild Red Hood, uh, which they haven't gotten in print yet, but have been following on Manga Plus as well. Mm -hmm. uh, good list. Very good list. So Number four. Number four. Um, my number four is a from a creator that is also a Yen Press release, just by the way. Um, but this is from a creator that I also have really enjoyed prior work from. I think I own all of her releases, maybe. I think so. Um, and this is Asumiku Nakamura's Tales of the Kingdom. Uh, we only have mm -hmm. one volume out in English so far but i do believe there's three volumes in japanese um this is a beautiful hardcover release in the style of 
like a bride story from Yen. And it's not quite, I, I would say it's a series of vignettes um, set in a kind of Persian fantasy setting mm -hmm. um, and each vignette each little story snapshot is very well it's focused on the relationship between brothers ultimately um, our our main or our opening story which is also um, got a spread of color pages is about two identical twins, one who was raised as a prince and one who had been imprisoned his whole life um, at the age of mm -hmm. tw like 12 or 13 when they discovered each other. They decided to switch places only for a night, but of course the imprisoned brother never went back for his, his more fortunate brother um, because the brother who was imprisoned was meant to be or was in imprisoned in preparation for once the prince took the throne um his his brother would be like a blood sacrifice for him in his place mm -hmm. um but many years later when they are brought face to face again um they decide to basically just run away together and live together and there's a very um, interesting binding of fates between these characters and their relationship. They mm -hmm. both fall in love with the same woman. And so there's like a very, mm, yeah, very interesting dynamic here. Um, so asterisk for implied incest <laughs> here. Um, it's not, this is your content warning. Um, and so that's that kind of initial introductory story um but the but other... it's so aesthetic it's, it's aesthetic so aesthetic incest g it's Asumika Nakamura <laughs> like it's just so sultry and be like no matter what you do and no matter how weird it gets she's just so good at capturing that that feeling of just falling into something um I just really, really enjoyed this first volume. Like always, Nakamura's characters mm -hmm. are all very complicated people. The these relationships we see between brothers and also like other people, but namely brothers, come in all sorts of forms. Um, we see a reflection of brothers who are much closer, um, don't have such a tumultuous past, but none of them are truly quote unquote free of sin. Um, mm -hmm. it's really, really good. There, it's got that kind of dark fairy tale twist to a lot of these stories. And that's really what it does feel like is, is kind of a series of fairy tales, even though it is also a series of stories about brotherhood and siblings and kind of this these relationships that we don't that we are born into um that we don't have a choice in like genetically um and kind of how that draws people together or or tears them apart as well um yeah i mean this was another one that i was highly anticipating um just knowing that i adore nakamura's work has her signature art style so if you've read any of her her comics before you know what i mean this again because of this persian setting there's a lot of very beautiful detailed pieces of fashion and jewelry and the aesthetic of the setting really really shines with her art style and her attention to detail um, but of course, in saying that, Nakamura is never, she uses a lot of negative space. She uses a lot of empty backgrounds. Um, her settings aren't, her the actual physical world that we, or the in comics we are focused on the characters, not so much the place. 
um, which I think mm -hmm. works very well for this kind of ethereal, not, you know, ethereal kingdom fairy tale. of fairy tales. Yeah. Um, yes, it's very good. The characters come across, like, because of, like, those artistic traits, they come across very much, like, less as individuals and more as archetypes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh... Yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, volume as well, um, but I already knew it was on your list, so I didn't put it <laughs> on mine, because <laughs> we try not to cross over, um, and I actually, I think I enjoyed the second story more, the one mm -hmm. of the king and his attendant. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we, I don't think we've gotten the full story there yet. Uh, it's going to continue into the next one, but what we've gotten so far is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, very melodramatic. Excited to see where that goes. We sort of got the end of the story first, and now we're going gradually further and further back. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, my takeaway from this is that up to and including incest as um essentially aesthetic <laughs> <laughs> the story and visuals here are incredibly takarazuka and it mm. made me wonder if uh asumiko nakamura uh is a zuka ota like sdam definitely is <laughs> um but <laughs> uh yeah that's uh that's my takeaway. Mm. Uh <laughs> just very lavish, very lush, very melodramatic, uh romantic, sultry, mm -hmm. um, androgynous. So Yep. It's beautiful. Good book. Beautiful, <laughs> and if you like nice hardcovers as well, that it is, uh, it is a nice hardcover. And uh, if you like this book and you want some Takarazuka to watch, you should watch uh, Konjiki no Sabaku, The Golden Desert from 2016, Flower Troop. <laughs> Thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you? What is your uh, number four? My number four uh, is another classic title, because my whole list is classic titles. There's a spoiler <laughs> for my whole list. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it that way. It just happened that way, because that's who I am as a person. Mm. <laughs> um, and I let G have a couple of titles that I wanted. <laughs> uh, number four is Orochi, uh, the perfect edition mm. uh, by... Uh, my favorite horror mangaka, Kazuo Umez. Uh, we got one volume of this published by Viz back in 2002. <laughs> <laughs> and now we are getting it again, but all of it this time. Uh, this was originally published 1969 to 1970. Um, one of Umez's most famous works, along with stuff like The Drifting Classroom, and um, uh, The Cat-Eyed Boy. Mm -hmm. I think I like those two better than this, but mm -hmm. I still greatly enjoyed Orochi. Uh, Orochi is a basically a series of interconnected short stories. Um, they're only interconnected in the same way that Cat-Eyed Boy yeah. stories are connected to each other, which is by the framing character Orochi, who is, uh, we don't get to know much about her. She is a an immortal being who takes the form of a teenage girl. Um, she has some sort of psychic powers that are pretty vaguely defined. Um, and she just kind of goes around observing people. She's interested in the relationships between other human beings and she likes sort of 
picking people to sort of follow throughout their lives. So we mm-hmm. get a lot of stories like that. Um, other than the character of Orochi, this is much less supernaturally focused than either of those other series that I mm-hmm. mentioned. Cat-Eyed Boy has a lot of like yokai and stuff. Drifting Classroom is a lot happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much. So much in Drifting Classroom. <laughs> Um, yeah, read it. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is one of the scariest things I've ever read in my life, and I love it. Um, (laughs) This one is less, I would say less of the stories are straight up, like, terrifying horror than either of those other two Mm -hmm. series. There's even some stories that, like, don't end horrifically. Mm -hmm. Most of them do. Don't misunderstand. (laughs) Most of them end in the worst way possible. (laughs) But every once in a while you get one that doesn't even end particularly badly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you're like, well, that's nice for a change. (laughs) And then Orochi is like, well, that's nice for a change. And she goes off to the next story. (laughs) um, This is much more overtly about like the human horror of just the evil that people can be capable of Uh particularly within the family um there's a lot of parent-child relationships going horribly horribly wrong in this especially there's a pattern of parent-child relationships that seemed idyllic at first when the child was too young to start showing personality traits, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, And then parents being disappointed by how their kid turned out or knowing something about their kid that their kid doesn't know. Um, And basically turning on them. Uh, Sometimes the child turns on the parents. Um, But I feel like overall what I was interested in in this collection of stories is that once again, like, Umez has this very deep empathy for children. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you would have a story that starts out a particular way, like, there's a story about a boy who lies all the time. He's just Mm -hmm. a chronic, pathological liar. Everybody hates him for it. They call him liar. (laughs) Um, And you're like, okay, this is going to be like a boy cried wolf moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and it starts off that way it starts going in that direction but in the end the message is more like you know at the end of the day he's five (laughs) yeah yeah um and like maybe we should believe kids sometimes Mm -hmm. maybe even if they lie a lot and maybe they'll grow out of it and it's okay to have a phase okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) um um, and there's another story I quite liked that starts off very typically as, like, this prodigal son narrative, mm-hmm. um, where the son oh, leaves, yeah, like, yeah. his country town, um, and goes to Tokyo and, like, leaves his family behind, um, and he, like, everything goes to shit in Tokyo, and he ends up having to join, like, the Yakuza and he becomes like a big bad yakuza guy. It it it's a lot. It is yeah. a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> but um eventually like he's got people after him. Everything's gone like the worst that it can go. So of course, he's the prodigal son returning home. His parents welcome him with open arms. Um but that's not the end of the story. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. so um and i think just the twists and turns that that narrative takes make it end up coming across less as like this weird conservative morality play and more complex it does have an element of that where it's like at the end it's like you know maybe maybe you should have called home once in a while you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) but but it has other things to say as well 
um, as just genuinely getting across a really creepy atmosphere. Um, and yeah, overall, I just, I enjoyed this, you know, I, I tend to enjoy Umez as a whole. Um, I don't think Orochi is as fun of a framing character as Cat-Eyed Boy, Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't dislike her. Um, I think the drifting class... A little, she's less of a gremlin compared to Cat Eye Boy. Yeah, is <laughs> she is. Sorry. She's a, she's like a, she's she's got like bystander syndrome, where mm. she tends to not uh, get involved until the last possible moment yeah. she could get involved. Um, but she does care. Like she sticks around watching these people because she cares. Whereas Cat Eye Boy is like. Well, I mean, I'm in their roof, so yeah. I can see what's happening. <laughs> he's curious, like a cat. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's just a little gremlin in real life, i.e. a cat. Um, so... <laughs> um, yep, and if you try to catch him, you'll get scratched. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, But anyway, yeah. Like I said, um, I do like the Drifting Classroom and Cat-Eyed Boy more, but Umez is just such an incredible creator to me, one of my favorites, that Orochi still very much deserves the spot on my list to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Mm. No, and I'm glad been... to have it in English again. Yeah, and it's so nice to see, again, we've spoken about this at length on different episodes of the podcast, but having a wider wider breadth of of Umez's works, horror, available in English. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, the fact it's no longer just the Jinji Ito show uh, <laughs> is yeah. always the... Uh, That's the other thing. Yeah. That's the other thing. Is like, now that we've done the Junji Ito podcast episode, and I have read all the big Junji Ito titles, uh-huh. I read Orochi... With a newfound appreciation for his craft as a horror mangaka, uh huh. I just like him so much more than Junji <laughs> Ito. <laughs> yeah. Goofy faces and all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I, to just echo that, it's just so nice to have these beautiful hardcover editions coming out from Viz. Um, you can see how much love is actually finally being brought to to some more horror manga because we not just with Viz, but a lot of other publishers are trying to diversify a little bit. There's only so much Junji Ito to go around, and at this point, what of his works hasn't been released? Um, and <laughs> I'm just glad that in the stopgap, we are seeing creators who had a chance quote unquote prior didn't didn't have the sales or the turnaround that they were hoping and then now again just due to how much the market has changed and how many more people are reading and how many more people i think are aware of just what what we don't see in english um the stuff that gets skipped Mm -hmm. over in favor of popularity is it's nice to see that happening that changing and uh orochi has been fantastic i cannot wait i cannot wait for the re-release of cat-eyed boy that is yes amazing um and yeah again we wax poetic about this like every time we talk about horror <laughs> manga or um junji ito particularly but just just the state of horror in English. Please, please, please try Umez's works. If you haven't, they are yes. phenomenal. And just, yeah, yeah. incomparable. Don't incomparable. take our word for it. <laughs> Junji Ito wants you to read Umez too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, if that's the reason, if that's the reason why his works have finally returned is because people who like Ito are like, well, now I should read this. 
thank you thank you do that <laughs> and enjoy <laughs> you're welcome okay <laughs> and now i would like to read another list that we have received mm -hmm. i think i'll go for two mm -hmm. um a short one and a longer one uh that we received from our viewers uh we have from at that manga dude says really loved lost lad london yokohama kaidash kiko and sakamoto days mm -hmm. uh did you check out sakamoto days i did not get the chance to check this one out mm-hmm yeah, I haven't I haven't read this one yet. I know it's super duper popular and I believe it's getting an anime very soon. So um it's one that kind of plays that and I I might just be unfairly comparing it to something like Spy Family or even um mm -hmm. Yuzakura No, what is it called? Yuzakura when that's in jump right now. Um uh I don't know. <laughs> I, I uh, uh, Yozakura family. I kept wanting to say Yozakura quartet, and I know that's a completely different yeah. series. Um, <laughs> that's different. <laughs> that's a different series. Um, no, Yozakura <laughs> family. Yozakura, Yozakura, whatever it is. Um, that is also kind of like the comedy action. Um, you know, they're a bunch of weirdos and, you know, are in that one, they're spies, but in this one, mm -hmm. um, well, I think he's just like an assassin, but he's also just a dude. Um, and that's the humor. <laughs> um, there's, there's been a couple series like this uh, action comedy out, especially in jump right now. So it's not for lack of interest, but I, uh, there's. There's a couple other that others that I am aware of and have previously tried. So oh, Sakamoto Days, I'll get to. I'm sure in some capacity. It's on Jump. I'll mm -hmm. I'll get to it. <laughs> it seems very popular okay. from everything I see from whenever new chapters are released, which is every week. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then I'll read another list. This mm -hmm. one is from at Sunlit Lake. Uh, number their number one is I want to be a wall. Uh, they say the ace rep was so good I cried. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, ladies on top. Uh, they say English lettering was superb. Number three, Hiraeth, the end of the journey. Yuki Kamatani, nuff said, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Four, my brain is different. Very honest look at neurodivergency. Yes, I agree. And number five, our torsos align. They say beautiful artwork. Absolutely. Um, I don't read... remember which one is that one. That one uh, our torsos align <laughs> is it has just very recently been released by uh, I want to say Seven Seas. Um, it's the mm -hmm. same creator as Matic, um, and it is ah. the collection of like short stories uh, between monsters and people. Um, it's very good. It's, nice. It's an, it's a good time. <laughs> um, having read another all piece, of... yeah, for the monster fuckers, huh? Exactly. And this one's <laughs> this one's more focused on uh het monster fucking, where obviously Matic is very gay. Um, so <laughs> no matter what your personal proclivities are, they gotcha. Um, <laughs> they've got a monster for you. They got a monster for you. <laughs> um, I do like, um, especially the first story in that one. Um, the monster is like this big bird man. It's really like he's really sweet. I like him. Um, <laughs> and there's there's uh like a one set on a like a alien planet or well obviously like a different planet. Um, and there's a Un, I, I don't even know how to well obviously a monster that is in the the author's note described as like um based on sculpture right um and so mm -hmm. because of this has no limbs like you look at the marble statues and they are limbless obviously because of their mm -hmm. age um but they so it's basically like um like a statue of, of 
Nike or Nike. Um, but instead of limbs, it has like weird little tentacle things that shoot out of it. There's, there's, mm, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and a lot of different variations of monsters. It's not just like, I don't know, a werewolf or something boring, right? <laughs> They're monsters, <laughs> like proper monsters. Um, <laughs> Are you judging me for my vampire love? No, <laughs> but I just see vampires <laughs> as the undead. They're not monsters in the same way that like a giant bird man with a beak and and like You're claws correct. are <laughs> right <laughs> um but great list i have read all of those i enjoy all of those and um they're good spread good spread of different different genres and types of releases man g our viewers have so much taste well of course they do listen to listen to who they're listening to jeez <laughs> we are we the are opinion. your humble podcast hosts <laughs> 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 all right and shall we go on to the halfway point on our list would you like to talk about your number three my number three yes i would like to talk about it because i not only started it this year, I finished it this year. I am very emotionally vulnerable and broken about this series. <laughs> um, this is another series from a creator that I have enjoyed pr previous works from. Um, it's not... Uh, this is Blackguard by Rio Hanada. Mm -hmm. Five-volume series released by Kodansha. Um, this is a... I haven't finished this one yet. Oh, how far did you get into it? Because I remember you read the first, at least the first volume in Japanese. Yeah, and that's where I'm, that's where I'm at right now. Like, I, it's one that I need to, like, get yeah. on, but it's yeah. like, I just prioritized other things for this podcast. Yes, yeah. Um. So I read this, this is set in a far future dystopia wherein humanity has been savaged by this virus that turn it's kind of like a zombie virus if you get infected you then become the monstrous shoujo which are kind of like these monkey monster they're monkeys violent violent monsters that you know, feed upon human flesh <laughs> monkeys <laughs> they are monkeys um <laughs> it's this virus. Humanity has been fighting it for a long time. We're not doing very well against it. They continue to... These monsters or these this virus continues to evolve. So um, the types of shoujo that humanity were first like overrun by now continue to adapt to the various onslaught of, you know, munitions that humanity tries to tries to kill them with. Our main character is um, part of like an elite, an elite, well, guard, like military maybe or security division um, who mm -hmm. go out and try and kill these shoujo every, every day, um, all the time, protect humanity. Um, he is also known as Blackguard because he wears all black, uh, because he suffers from a... Mm, he suffers from something called Morbius C, which is basically suicidal tendencies. Um, but he's just really good at his job. He also doesn't use a gun. He fights with a katana, so he's just like a guy with a cool... Just like punk. super edgy. Yeah, super edgy, <laughs> black hair, black black coat. Katana. Black hair with a white streak. With a white streak. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so he's, he's, doesn't have any regard for his own life. He's wanting to die by these monsters, but also he's just like so kick ass that he just keeps killing these monsters regardless. Um, <laughs> he does his job, but he's also like wouldn't be sad if he died by a monster. Um, anyway, because he's so good at his job, the the security force or these these guards, this 
are like, we can't let him die because he's just, like, his kill count is so high. We just, he, we have to make sure he keeps working, uh, which isn't a, isn't that a statement of fucking capitalism right there? But we need him <laughs> to keep working, so we're going to partner him with, like, another really, really competent guy. His name's Chris. Um, and... So you he's going to kind of try and be his babysitter. And mm-hmm. so through this partnership, our main character starts to slowly learn, starts to slowly learn, like, the value of human life. He, prior to this, he really didn't look after himself whatsoever. Um, he he didn't even eat, like, food. He ate just the, the crap jelly rations that they would give them. You know, this is the mm-hmm. dystopia. Nutrition blocks. Nutrition blocks. He didn't have even his little, like, personal AI from his apartment. He didn't even do any settings for. He just doesn't... He hasn't engaged in society at all. He doesn't have any kind of family or community support. So Chris becomes, like, his first... His first friend, his first person who gave a shit about him, um, even though mm-hmm. they're at odds for a little bit, uh, they very quickly become friends. Um, and so whilst this is happening, society, humans are also trying to figure out, like, where did this, like, what is this virus? How does it, like, they know how it spreads, but, like, why does it affect some people more than others? Why do some people get bitten and it takes, you know, hours and days and how lo- long to, to develop or to show symptoms, whereas some people get bitten and immediately, immediately they are an, a monster. What, what determines that? How does this, and why does it keep evolving? Anyway, um, yeah, this is, I'm not going to, I don't want to speak too much on the overall story because I want Ray to read it Um, and I want (laughs) everyone listening to read it and so I'm not going to get too far into spoilers but it is like with Hanada's other series it has a wonderful really interesting collection of characters a lot of different personalities Um, I wanted to read the the author's note at the end of the last volume. I don't think there's any spoilers here, but I will read it because it, I think it encapsulates Hanada's approach to this particular series, especially compared mm-hmm. to um, Devil's Line, which is their other major series that we've seen in English. <clears throat> so, for once, I would like to write a proper afterword at the end of the volume. I've always drawn more manga when there are extra pages, but this time I want to sit quietly and think about Minami and the others, who got to live and pass on happily just a little longer. I'd also like to take this chance to analyze Blackguard myself. Firstly, with my previous work Devil's Line, the love between Anzai and Tsukasa and the story's cushy ethics felt almost too comforting. I kind of rebelled against them. The real world is filled with all sorts of things. Love, cruelty, sickness, death, absurdity. But I think I shied away because it was too painful for me to face them. It is, of course, a normal human defense mechanism. In Devil's Line, while the stigma against devils makes for an immensely strong enemy, the characters have the option of fighting it. But what about in the inevitability of old age, individual hardships, unpreventable diseases, and death? I started thinking about all that, and the end result was Blackguard. So, there's more to that, but that's... (laughs) Reflecting on that and looking at the approach that Hanada had for for Blackguard going into it, I, there is definitely less of a, I don't say hopeful end, there's less of a hopeful end in so far as like this is a very hard situation and there's no correct answer to this, which is why the characters over the course of the series have to make decisions that sometimes go against what would be 
good, like better for the, the wider good and just ser- mm-hmm. like a little bit self-serving, the selfishness there. Mm-hmm. Um, but also like this hope that o- generally that people and humanity um, have this inherent want to survive, which is this obviously it goes completely counter to our main character his introduction right this not caring whether Mm -hmm. he lives or dies and then the evolution of not wanting to die wanting to stay with the people that care about you um yeah blackguard it's not a perfect series uh it's it's messy it's one that messy in so far as that I think I I think it's the right length for what the story is. I <laughs> the last volume has a whole bunch of like contextual info dump stuff that never made it into the <laughs> series. I don't mm-hmm. think stuff like how this virus got to earth or like why you know why XYZ all of the little bits and pieces of this, you know, this topic culture and society needed to be explained um it's it's superfluous to the story but i do think Mm -hmm. that if you are someone who like focuses more like well that was a plot thread that wasn't addressed i'm like well yeah okay but i don't actually care whether or not robots do (laughs) like this i just i care about the characters and i think if you are someone Mm -hmm. who does care about characters and kind of the over overwhelming themes and story and message of of a piece of work or or a story like this um you will get you, you will enjoy it rather than getting hung up on like so who invented the nutritional blocks that they eat like you don't need to know <laughs> or i don't think you need to know that um walmart yeah exactly pretty much um I think it's a, like with Devil's Line, although that has kind of a supernatural twist, this one is more of that sci-fi dystopic twist. It is ultimately a story about people and relationships between people. And people, like the character's self-identity within the community and the culture that they live in. Um, It's very, very good. Um, just quietly, it's also gay, and it's, Yay! yes, and it doesn't cheap out on it as well, so, um, which, again, there's a very, aside from, like, main characters, their relationship, we also have a really lovely depiction, um, of a, like with, in Devil's Light, of a trans character, and her, her relationship with the people in her life it's um which is also both painful and and very well done um yeah there's just like a really lovely normalcy to like a really unnormal situation (laughs) of monkey (laughs) monsters running around um and, and like with devil's line Ultimately, this is a story about love. Um, so check it out. Try it. It's it's not long. It's only five volumes. And <laughs> it's good. Anyway. Uh, and I cried at the end. So yeah. just, just, you know. <laughs> yep. Uh, we know I also loved Yohanada. Um, Devil's Lion is one of my favorite series. Uh, it's just one that I haven't, you know, in, in the mess that was this year for me, I haven't gotten around to yet, but I am very much looking forward to reading this and I will probably also cry. So (laughs) get ready to to prepare for those tears. (laughs) I'm so excited. (laughs) Uh, the monkey monsters are so goofy looking though so goofy looking (laughs) (laughs) and at at Um, some point they evolve wings so they're flying monkeys oh good 
<laughs> Excellent. I can't wait. <laughs> um, yeah, I love certain aspects of Hanada's art, but sometimes it it can be pretty awkward. <laughs> yeah, affectionate. I, they're not. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're not the best artist on this list. Um, but I love them all the same. <laughs> um, okay. And then my number three is a drawn and quarterly release of a alternative mangaka. Mm -hmm. um, this is Talk to My Back uh, by Yamada Murasaki, um, translated by Ryan Holmberg, who also provides a really nice essay in the back, which if you've read any like drawn and quarterly manga releases, you'll be used to... Uh, those essays that they like to provide with them. Um, always an excellent addition, uh, particularly here. It uh, really helps to sort of know... First of all, it's really interesting to get sort of this background on the alternative manga scene. Um, and basically, Yamada Murasaki trying to get into manga and her process like getting into calm and then from there getting into gato as we see sort of this revolution occurring in shoujo manga um and uh particularly the year 24 group mm -hmm. um because she's sort of walking like her this work is very blatantly feminist mm -hmm. um Oh, boy, uh, an outwardly it? feminist. And um, so it's interesting to see it in context with other types of uh, manga with feminist themes being created by other feminist women mm -hmm. um, at the time. Uh, this series is Yamada Murasaki's most prominent work and was published originally from 1981 to 1984. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what is this? It's basically, it's a series of very quiet, unassuming vignettes mm -hmm. um, about a housewife and mother. She's probably, I don't know, 30s. She, she's been with her husband a long time. Mm. She's got two kids um, who start out pretty young, but we they get older as the series goes on. And each chapter is like a little observation, obs like observational look glimpse into her life. Um, and she's at a point in her life where she especially as her kids start showing more independence from her, getting older, getting more involved in school. Um, she, the magic is wearing off for her <laughs> in her marriage and in her motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, she is chafing, chafing against the expectations of being a stay-at-home mother in Japan in the 80s um, and realizing that with her kids away at school and the spark long dead in her marriage to her deadbeat husband who comes home super late every night and just wants to kick his feet up and shout for tea or whatever <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that She's lost her purpose. She doesn't know what to do. We see her sort of contemplating divorce, but she doesn't go through with it. Mm -hmm. We see her um, working a job for a while, a part-time job, but ultimately being let go because she is a mother and somebody younger comes along. Um, and... Yeah, it, it's just sort of this period in her life, I guess. Um, I 
really appreciated this more than I thought I would, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoy her artwork. Uh, it's a very fluid, it's very effortless. Um, it reminds me of someone who is, does stories of a similar type and from a similar era, mm -hmm. um, who actually gets mentioned quite a bit in parallel to her in the essay. Um, uh, Kono Yoko mm. is her name. Um, she's like, yeah, does a lot of manga just about like older women, especially like uh, in established relationships with family is sort of low key. Um, and one of my favorite like short story collections in manga called Boga Ippon is a short story collection by her. Mm. Really love it. Mm. Um, would love to see some of her work in English, uh, especially that one. Drawn in quarterly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that there's a lot that this speaks to with women, even now, particularly women of a particular generation. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe not so much people who are, like, my age or your age, <laughs> yeah. but, like, people who are my mother's age. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly, like, my parents just went through um, a divorce. And, like, you know, some of it definitely had me tearing up, like, thinking about my mother. Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything, like... I think that this is a very Japanese family setup and a very Japanese sexism that is being spoken to here. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly overlapping elements with sexism and patriarchy and like how deeply anti-mother um, society is here in the West as well, here yeah. in the US, which is where I am. Um, but I also think that this is very in line with a lot of the older couples that I met while I was in Japan mm -hmm. and was sort of appalled by how little husband and wife seemed to even talk to each other ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and how casually even like if the woman was working, like, full time she was just expected to do everything um even now um and i think it's changing slowly with younger people but i think there's still a lot of people um especially out in the boonies where i lived where girls just have this expectation that that's what their life is going to be like yeah and i feel like companies over there still very much are very anti-woman and anti-mother in how women are forced into these part-time positions. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of fields in Japan where it's incredibly hard as a woman to find full-time work. They just, and even if you do, you'll find yourself being pushed yeah. into part-time work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even to this day. Um, so to me, I found a lot of what was being argued in this book. And it is very didactic. So I mean, uh -huh. like, if you're not here to read a feminist text, <laughs> then <laughs> you're out of luck. You know, you're gonna then you're gonna be like, well, this is annoying. Why does this woman keep yelling at me? <laughs> yeah. But like if you're here for what she's what she's telling you, I feel like she the way that she words a lot of things is very eloquent she comes from a background not just in manga but also in poetry and i think that that shines through um i think the translation does a good a pretty good job of capturing that mm -hmm. um lyricism and eloquence um in her narration uh and 
yeah, I, I enjoyed this. I enjoyed it quite a lot. I yeah. think it's a an aspect, a part of the feminist movement in Japan that we don't see um, brought into English as, at least in manga form, as often. Like, we mm-hmm. get a lot of the gal manga mm-hmm. stuff that focuses on women in their 20s who are very sexually liberated, you know, who are young and wild and free yeah um but we don't necessarily see a lot of the stuff that's more focused at older women who have settled down who are dealing with um husbands who work late every night Mm -hmm. um who don't seem to care what goes on during the don't seem to care about their own kids yeah you know um so yeah i liked this This was one that I had my eye on for a long time. I also really, really enjoyed it. It's one that I think you summed up perfectly in that it's, it really is like a truly feminist piece of work that focuses on feminism for women who are in this kind of middle stage of their life. They've, they don't have the, um, kind of glitz and glamour of of youth and beauty and whatever else anymore that a lot of people rely on when they're younger. They've not quite gotten to like the later stages of their life. They're stuck as what could be seen it like they we know that women so very often are stuck with the burden of almost everything within maintaining a family in it when we look at like traditional roles, um, especially for women who are for a long time, just stay at home, even not inherently because they want to, but because they need to, they think that they need to be stay at home. Right. Um, we see that with this character going out and getting a part-time job and just having that little bit of individual freedom that isn't, that she gets to interact with people that aren't just like her kids or her husband um or maybe the neighbors next door right uh it's it is such a good yeah i think it it's one that is so good and still so relevant for a lot of people unfortunately um it really challenges those those expectations of motherhood and being a woman in your you know 30s 40s and how society treats you and how, you know, that your, how society forces women to give up their individuality in order to maintain the family structure, um, and to, you know, be the best mother they can be for their children and for their husbands. Um, it, yeah, I also, this is a really, really, really good book. Um, and (laughs) I hope we see more of its type in the future. Uh, yes. And I wanted to finish talking about it just by quoting a couple of these more sort of poetic, uh, persuasive, I guess, Mm -hmm. sections in here. Um, because I do like often how this narration is worded, how the more didactic pieces of this are worded. Um, she says... Husbands talk down to their wives to assuage their manly egos. Well, wives, they compensate by trying to make daily life pleasant. What's lonely is not that their husbands don't recognize and respect them, but that they're trapped inside this flesh called the family, which exists simply so the man has a woman to protect his ego. A family is a stew of children and cats and whatever. It clings to me like my own flesh. And yet, for some reason, the husband feels like an outsider. Why is that? Um, and then right at the end, uh, this is like the very last page. It's what it ends on. Mm-hmm. Uh, she says, and this is not very kind to men. So, <laughs> forewarning if you've, <laughs> if that triggers you, I guess. <laughs> men live in a dream. They always want to be treated like children. When they're strong, we indulge them in this fantasy simply because they're men. Women, on the other hand, 
have reality shoved into their faces. Useless dreams are not luxuries they can entertain for long. No matter how much they may hate the real world, they do not have the luxury of acting like children. That's what I was upset about. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just one more thing that just came to me. But yeah, yeah. I do like that reading the essay, you would think that her portrayal of the husband in this book would be worse. Yeah, just the, the worst kind <laughs> uh, of person. Given what she's, what she's been through. She's uh -huh. been through a lot. Um, but I felt that the husband in this, he, again, he felt very, like, realistic to what, um, and I don't want to say awful men aren't realistic, especially, again, given the context here and the person we're talking about, mm -hmm. the author we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but just like I've met so many men like this man, mm -hmm. um, you know, he cheats on his wife because he's felt the spark gone from the marriage for a long time, too. Um, and he's barely home anyway. Um, so it's like you kind of end up feeling like, oh, my God, please, bitch, divorce him. Yeah. But also you kind of like understand why they don't go through with it in the end, too. Uh -huh. They just kind of stick together in their ambivalence. The husband, like, after getting caught cheating, is like, oh, shit, actually, I really made a mistake. And you can see him, like, trying in his own kind of small, pathetic way to be more of a husband and more of a father. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's not enough. But also, like, that's life. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? <laughs> I, I, it, that, I don't know, that sort of ambivalence there rang true to me yeah it, it does get into sort of you know there's there's this idea that the wife in the story keeps going back to that you know marriage is not about love at the end of the day it's a trade mm -hmm. you know that she's going to be keeping daily life pleasant as i said in that um passage and the husband's role in return is to be loyal mm-hmm um, and she talks about how they've both sort of ended up failing their end of the bargain. Um, and it's a very cynical sentiment, but like it rings true in a very sad way, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. The book is, uh, unflinching towards mm -hmm. him, but mm -hmm. also not unsympathetic, mm -hmm. I guess. It's like he's being the way that he is because it's how he's been raised to be. Mm -hmm. It's how society has told him he's supposed to be. He doesn't know any other way. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make it okay, but it does make it what it is. And ex <laughs> an explanation is not an excuse, right? Like that's just, they're, yeah. they're both products of, their, of society and their upbringing and the expectations placed on men and women. It can be very hard to recognize your own bad behavior when attaching yourself and performing to what you you've believed is your role and you, you've believed is like the correct way to live um you've been told is the correct way to live it's yeah it's a hard one and it's something that takes generations to you know unfuck <laughs> uh, we're not quite there yet but yeah. it keeps getting better mm -mm. <laughs> Yep, we need people like Yamada Murasaki to mm -hmm. be speaking out about it. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, and before we get into our number twos, uh, I would like to read another list from our viewers. Yay! Um, from our unofficial moderator <laughs> at Storied Shelves, Stories on Shelves says, really enjoyed Hiraeth, The End of the Journey, and A Galaxy Next Door. Mm. Uh, they say, there were so many debuts this year, weren't there? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and they also say, and how could I forget Nightfall Travelers? Ah, good one. Uh, uh, did, did you get a chance to read I will take your word one? for it. Did you get a chance to read it? Or no? No. no. It's 
No. It's a... Uh, it's a very beautiful um, collection of two girls, two, two classmates, going to like all the different haunted spots in their town. Um, it is like an Iyashike, mm -hmm. um, like an Iyashike Yuri with a supernatural twist. Um, it's very good. It's, it's got mm -hmm. some beautiful color pages in there as well. Cool, cool, cool. Alrighty. And G, into our top two now. Top two. What is your number two? My number two is, I'm kind of cheating, um, because I didn't, start reading this this year but i it did start coming out in print this year i did reread this in or this volume in preparation for this podcast to see if i was just like having fond memories about the more recent stuff i knew it was a strong opening but i just hadn't revisited revisited it yet um, and this is Dan to Dan mm -hmm. by Yuki Nobu Tatsu, mm -hmm. Volume 1. It's from Viz. Um, we spoke a lot about this, I think, last year uh, when it was a digital debut. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the story of two high school kids, a girl who believes in like spirits and ghosts, uh, but she's not really like her, her grandmother's a medium or a psychic or whatever. Um, but she's just kind of normal. She's had a, she's a very string of bad boyfriends um, and is kind of not not doing too well. Um, but she sees a, a big nerd, a big nerd from another class getting bullied. <laughs> she steps in and um, like stops them talking smack about him being a weirdo. Mm -hmm. um, and he thinks that the reason she stepped in is because she believes in aliens because he's just like really into the aliens and she's like nobody would that's not real nobody believes that um that's how that's <laughs> so stupid and he's like well what do you she's like, what do you believe in and it's like well a spirit my you know grandma's a medium and he's like that's so dumb everyone knows ghosts aren't real that's so stupid um so they d dare each other to go to like a, a spot that's super haunted and then a spot that is like well known for alien abduction and lo and behold they both run into aliens and yokai monster spirits um mm -hmm. the 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 mystical and supernatural uh reveal themselves uh drawing them in and then oh my gosh Chaos in, then ensues um, <laughs> because our our female character she gets abducted um, and is very um, very closely almost assaulted by these aliens who want to repopulate pro pro, pro want to repopulate um, you know aliens culture with uh, you know a female human. Um, and then our male character, he gets caught up running away from this monster, and she's like, well, I will now possess you. Um, Turbo Granny. Turbo Granny. She possesses him and also, like, eliminates his dick. Il which she steals is, his dick. Which is a, a, a problem uh, for a young, young man <laughs> in the height of puberty, <laughs> I would say. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> after, after you know escaping and doing whatever they're like well he's possessed still and also has no dick so we need to try and figure out like <laughs> how to fix that also the aliens are like still running around trying to cause problems um so yeah they just becomes they they end up due to both ending up in horrible situations and feeling like bad that they got each other in these bad situations in trying to fix this this problem because like this girl didn't really like she wasn't really friends with this dude but like it's not fair that he now doesn't have a dick because she's like i'll oh, go to this haunted <laughs> tunnel right um and Ooh. so they kind of become well they become friends pretty quickly but um now they're trying to 
reclaim certain body parts that have gone missing. Uh, they also <laughs> awake our main character, her kind of psychic powers. Um, and our main male character, he starts kind of getting more conscious control over the possession that he has. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. This this first volume is still such a perfect blend of comedy and craziness, action, horror, uh, phenomenal... Just a little sprinkling of pathos. Yes, abs they're, when they're finally friends, when, oh, when she finds out his name, she, she gets so pissed off. Um, because <laughs> she he shares the name with her favorite like perfect man this this actor who she adores and she's like oh. how dare that super be manly name? actor who's like in yakuza movies and stuff it's it's Ooh. her dream man which is why like all of her boyfriends up until this point have just been really shitty because she's going for <laughs> a very particular type of person a very particular kind of look um, mm -hmm. but when she finds out that this boy shares the name with this actor she's like how dare you i i refuse to call you by your name yeah, absolutely not that is <laughs> that is not your name that's not we're not gonna call you that <laughs> um and he's like well that oh, sorry but that's just my name so, no that's not your we're not calling you that that's I, that's not your name no. <laughs> <laughs> incorrect Incor we, we, we do not acknowledge Whatever it was you just said, because we are making an executive decision. <laughs> this is your nickname. I'm Whatever mistakes you were made by your parents <laughs> in the past. <laughs> <laughs> we also have um, our main character, her grandmother, who is um, a very young looking uh, hot lady who does have wonderful powers of medium and a fortune teller. Um, who's kind of their guide, trying to help them, help these kids sort something out. Um, and this particular volume ends with them, well, with them challenging Turbo Granny. And then the, and then the monster, like the other spirit that Turbo Granny had, uh, like, merged with, um, that giant crab is now chasing them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remember this part! Uh, yeah, it is a phenomenal series. It's hilarious. It just keeps getting better. It's one of those series, I follow this on the, um, the Manga Plus app. Uh, you can also read it on Shonen Jump's website. It's not on the Shonen Jump app because of, like, I don't want to say nudity. Content. But content, <laughs> violence, just this stuff. Um... But it's one that, like, you think you know where it's going, and then it'll just throw another, like, five wrenches in there, and it'll be even more crazy and bizarre and over the top. And you're introduced <laughs> to a new character, and you're like, oh my god, who's this idiot? And then they're an idiot, but then you love them. They just grab your heart so quickly, and they make you laugh, they make you cry. The relationship, the friendship, and, like, bubbling romantic feelings between these characters are also really good. Um... Yeah, mm -hmm. if you like crazy monsters and a phenomenal, like, honestly, some of the best action paneling um, around right now, this and Chainsaw Man. Um, if, if, you, <laughs> if you like really dynamic series, a lot of great characters, a lot of action, a lot of weird, weird monsters. Also, just in the actual release itself, the lettering i have to applaud the english team because they just have captured the the essence of this series the lettering's phenomenal the comedy the translation and comedy maintained in that is so well done um yeah it's just amazing it's amazing it's amazing, and if you haven't tried it and you are a fan <laughs> of something like Chainsaw Man or even Hell's Paradise, um, things with that are a little bit zany, a little bit outside of the box, um, definitely, definitely try Don to Don um, because it is it is a joy to read, an absolute joy. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> um. 
I'll just add that this was one of the series that I ended up trying for my trek into the Shonen Jump uh, app slash website Mm -hmm. uh, for one of our podcast episodes, which is uh, Shonen Jump app spotlight. I think Mm -hmm. it's called something like that. Uh, We talk about this series extensively there as well. So please check that out if you have not. Um, I'm quite proud of that episode. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, you did a lot of work for that one, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> not to toot my own horn or anything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, good series, fun series. I need to catch up. <laughs> um, my number two is putting a little bit of micro publisher, uh, representation on this list, mm-hmm. uh, with. Uh, Starfruit Books publication. This is Town of Pigs by Hideshi Hino. Um, another classic horror mangaka. Uh, this particular story is from 1983. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is fucked up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. To put it mildly. <laughs> so, um, This is a book where I do wish that it had a similar treatment to Drawn and Quarterly's books, Mm -hmm. where I wish it had had, like, a bit of context on the creator. Yeah. Um, Because I think that it adds so much to the work Mm -hmm. to know a little bit about Hideshi Hino um, and some of the things that he went through uh, as a kid. Um... So if you are going to pick this book up, I definitely recommend giving his Wikipedia page, you know, a bit of a look. Just getting a bit of cursory information on some of the things that he's been through. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think it adds so many layers. Um, But even without that, um, it's an incredible horror story. It's about 180 pages long. So one volume. Mm -hmm. Um. And this is a story about a little boy who he hears some strange noises in the middle of the night. Um, and goes to check him out and finds that these mysterious shadowed barbarian demon figures Um, are appearing on horseback and drawing out everyone in the village, um, chaining them up and declaring that they are going to turn them all into pigs. Um, And we also get early on in the story that somehow these mysterious riders have missed him. He's the only person in the town who has escaped capture, just by virtue of being overlooked, they try to find him. Um, they're like, where's that boy? Um, but he manages to slip away and sort of watches everything that's happening as a frightened observer. Um, at first, he's overjoyed to realize that his family is being kept alive. Everyone's being kept alive. But, of course, what he discovers is that they're only being kept alive uh, to suffer a fate far worse than death. Mm. Um, To be um, crowded into pigsties and fed pig slop, um, forced to declare that they will become pigs for these strange demons... Um, or else face some truly horrific torture and public execution. Um, and yeah, we watch them transform into pigs, um, and then be forced to do horrible, horrible labor for these demons as pigs, um, as the demons are sort of 
also trying to find this little boy and he's trying to hide from them. Mm -hmm. But he cannot run and he cannot hide forever. Um, and there's a twist right at the end of the story um, that, I mean, it, it's very Planet of the Apes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he gets... Uh, he he's escaped these uh, riders for a while, but he ends up sort of climbing up on this strange effigy that they've built for themselves, almost like some figure that they worship. He climbs to the top of the giant statue and finds his own face staring down at him. Um, it is a statue of himself. And he's like, I don't understand. And all the riders just start cackling maniacally. And he tears the mask off of one of them, only to be faced with himself, staring back, cackling. And then they all take off their masks, and they're all him. Oh my god. <laughs> um, and that's how it ends. But this is just... It's a story about just how fathomlessly cruel humanity can be. Because mm -hmm. um, it's ultimately like how futile it is to run from these writers and how pointless their cruelty is. Yeah. There's no reason for it. Of course. There's like, there's. They're not doing this for any particular reason. Mm. They're just cruel. <laughs> They're just cruel. Mm. Um, and if you, especially if you know the context of um, what Hino went through uh, in the wartime, uh, what he's getting across here about sort of humanity and war and just the atrocities that humanity is capable of committing against itself uh, becomes very, very clear. Um, this is just a really incredible, like, classic horror story. Um, I think well worth a read. And, again, it's just great to see some of these great masters of Japanese horror uh, manga uh, made available in English. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, we we are hopefully getting more, well, we have been told we're getting more Hino in English from Starfruit Books as well. Um, so yes. this is not going to be the end of it. Mm-hmm. Which is excellent. <laughs> this is another, like, <laughs> foundational horror creator that has been missing from the English market for a long time. Um, I think starting with Town of Pigs or City of Pigs is, is kind of the other English title it goes by, is that's the groundwork for a lot of Hino's work. As you said, it would be nice to <laughs> contextually have a little bit of whether it's an essay or I know that having spoken to the people at Starfruit Books that it was published to the specifications that Hino wanted. Um, so I don't know mm -hmm. whether there was an opportunity for them to include like contextual stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that might have been completely out of their control. I don't know. I, this is what I've, mm -hmm. I'm got. I'm making a couple assumptions there, but it. It does, if this is your first Hino work um, and you do take the opportunity to look into his life, his context, especially regarding that particular work, I think it, it really gives you a, a solid basis to then have the context for his larger work and why his horror expresses itself in the way that it does. Um, mm -hmm. It's as... I mean, in a similar way to um, Umez, there's a kind of a real 
there's a very strong style with Hino's works. There's also like a this muckiness, mm -hmm. gooiness to a lot of his mm -hmm. his characters and settings. Yeah. Um it's very viscerally gross. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um which again has has had huge influence across the horror genre um in manga at least. And so it is really nice, especially from like such a small boutique publisher like Starfruit Books, mm -hmm. um, that we are getting this such a like such an influential, impactful, and important work mm -hmm. um, in some capacity. Because I do think that without the push from a more niche publisher, um, without someone smaller taking that risk and kind of proving mm -hmm. the market there that I don't know whether or not we would have seen as much like follow through with that from some of the larger publishers. I don't want to say that mm -hmm. like we would have never gotten um you know be very afraid of uh uh Kanako Kanako Inuki. Inuki, yes. Sorry. I I don't have my book in front of me right now, so but I don't yeah. I don't inherently <laughs> think that we we wouldn't have got that, but I also think that with a more classic mangaka getting that um, spotlight, we we we've seen the proof in the pudding, as it were, um, from mm -hmm. these smaller publishers leading this. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know if the larger publishers would have cared as much. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to more of Starfruit's um, horror offerings. They have a whole variety of stuff on in the pipeline. And this particular series, um, if you like... Well, I don't even know like is the right word. But if you value stories that are very... That are find their foundations in like post-war um direct mm -hmm. direct experience of of you know being japanese during the second world war um and how the art from those experiences expressed itself in the the decades afterwards i think this is one that is really a must read um mm -hmm. And absolutely, yeah. I don't like. I don't know if it's gonna be enjoyable, but it is worth <laughs> reading. <laughs> yes. Um, and also just an excellent work of horror. Yes. Like again, just talking about the craft. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very well put together. Very creepy. Mm -hmm. Well staged. Mm -hmm. The kind of horror I like to see. <laughs> <laughs> kind of horror we need more All of. All right. And then I am going to read our last handful of um, viewer lists mm -hmm. before going into our top two titles Number of one. the year. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, first from friend of the show at Rin Reads Manga. Uh, Rin says, some of mine are Look Back, Windbreaker, Until I Met My Husband, The New Editions of Canis, and Yakuza Fiance. Mm. Good list. Very good. Um, B at Bacchus Vines says, I didn't read many debuts this year. I like Imakoi and Crossplay. Mm -hmm. uh, Crossplay was one that I need to read. It looks cute. Yeah. Um, and then Eric Henwood Greer at EHG Superstar says, New titles out this year I loved include Tales of the Kingdom, Let's Go Karaoke, New York, New York. Uh, I would say Hereth, but I'm pissed it's digital only, so I'll go with Shonen Note and Lynx. Um, so yeah, another good list. Um, A lot of good perhaps, manga this year. Perhaps relevant. <laughs> perhaps relevant to our number ones. Yes. <laughs> um, speaking of which, uh, I'm wondering if you'll let me go first Absolutely. for the number one so that we can finish with your number one. Yes. Um, 
<laughs> because my number uh, one which is, is my... everyone's number one. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Including mine. Um, but I let you have it because I'm super nice like that. <laughs> what um, did I give you last year? I gave you something and therefore... You gave me um another work by this creator. Ah, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, my number one um is uh, New York, New York mm -hmm. by Marimo Ragawa, uh, which is one of those that's like I saw the license and I was like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> In what universe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I mean, I guess uh, the vampire and his pleasant companions must be doing well. Mm. <laughs> um, and all these LGBT series are doing well. LGBT like prestige series. So yes. why not one? From the creator of Baby and Me from 1995. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you why not. It, it's, uh, it, it shows its age. Yeah, it, it's not the most um, uh, accurate. Accurate or it's, like. Uh, it's. Yeah, huh. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it. Mm. I love it. I love it despite itself. Yes. <laughs> um, it's very well intentioned work. Say that. <laughs> and I think also, like, you look at it in the context of, you know, when it was coming out, the sort of what the BL structure was mm -hmm. then. Um, and yeah, it's like compared to other BL of the 90s, like, insanely good mm -hmm. are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> but also um, I look like at... planets different yeah. <laughs> completely different solar systems um but also to that point i think even though it this has not aged very well um it it has it's messy it's overall there's, there's so much drama and so many problems <laughs> to it but I think this is kind of the perfect example of when, when you have audiences, queer readers, asking mm -hmm. for like stories that don't have to be perfect about yes. queer identity. So like having the messiness and the toxicity and the drama mm -hmm. and the like just all of that stuff that is just all er, just the everything just the everything <laughs> but is but that is so accepted or just so like quote unquote normal within any kind of publication of uh, featuring het romance or cis romance mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. kind of messy drama where like bad things are happening and dumb shit is happening the fact that it doesn't <laughs> have to be a perfect representation of every you know, every queer person's lives, um, I think, makes it valuable and makes it worth reading, especially if you are sick of, like, reading uh, another award-winning nuanced take about, you know, <laughs> coming out or what it, like, just very, that we do see a lot. Which this one sure tries to be, G. Yeah. Uh -huh. It sure tries it to sure be. It sure does. <laughs> But again, it's 30 years old and okay. it doesn't understand. This is uh this is about uh Kane, uh who is a gay, um sort of closeted gay yeah. uh policeman in 1990s New York. Um he's a bit of a cruiser. Uh he likes going to the gay bars, picking up hot dudes. Um, feels like, you know, he, he's very, like, he's a very self-loathing gay man. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of, so he, lot of internal homophobia there. Oh, so much. <laughs> so much. And uh, <laughs> he's sh absolutely sure he's, like, he's never gonna settle down with anyone. Mm -hmm. he, like, that's not the life for him. He just needs to get off. That's all. Until he has a fateful encounter with 
a beautiful young blonde man, um, mild mannered, sweet, mysterious, mm. uh, named Mel. Um, and it is their romance. Uh, of course, Mel is one of our favorite BL tropes going back to Kaze Tokino Uta's <laughs> Gilbert, the hashtag most tragic boy <laughs> beyond tragic like not even you thought everything every single thing has happened to this man every bad thing that could ever he's like 22 every bad thing that has ever happened to a person has happened to this boy <laughs> everything and yet he comes out of it all the sweeter all the more mild-mannered and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> angelic, angelic blonde gay boy um, with a tragic past. Um, and a tragic but it is like let's love. be fair. He's a tragedy, a walking yes. tragedy. Okay, well, <laughs> G will get to the serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part <laughs> um Mari Moragawa is here to win an Oscar <laughs> um she is here to write a grand gay epic that includes every single gay issue she has ever read about at the library. <laughs> In 1995. <laughs> because she's certainly never met a gay man. Yeah, no. <laughs> and she's certainly never been to America. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has the same... Um, America as viewed from an outsider charm as Cypher. Mm -hmm. um, and it's wonderful. Are, <laughs> right. Are you telling me that America isn't just an ongoing loop of MTV music videos? I, I feel <laughs> betrayed. Or like police procedural like one-liners <laughs> and like... <laughs> Oh my gosh, his fucking, his Jewish co-worker, uh -huh. his closeted gay Jewish co-worker who dies of AIDS. Yes. <laughs> the way he's like, yeah, well, you know those Jews, he's kind of sneaky. And it's like, it's supposed to be like, yeah, it's supposed to be like, you know, there's this like discrimination in American society, but it's like, it's so clumsy and mm -hmm. clunky that it's like... Kane, what did you just say? <laughs> why, why would you ever say that? Oh. And it's like, okay, Ragawa like read a book about American racism and anti-Semitism, but has no idea how it actually presents itself in American society. <laughs> um, <sighs> it's, uh, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> But, like, first of all, some of the wacky, like, police procedural, like, true crime-ass shit that happens in this is so wild that you just can't help but have a ton of fun reading it. Uh -huh. um, the whole serial killer plotline is, like, honestly, I'm, like, it's such a page turner. Like it's so cheesy and it's like out of nowhere, but mm -hmm. it's, it, it's fun to read. It is fun to read. Um, and you're cheering when he, they have their tearful reunion at the end of it. Yeah. Um, I'm having a good time this whole thing, but also like at the end of the day, just like how fucking much these two men love each other, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a huge sap, and I just I just like seeing two LGBTs in LGBTs with each other, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's all I want. It's all I want. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing is that like these two literally like move fucking heaven and earth for each other because they are just the most yes! tragic people because they have the worst <laughs> luck in the world. Um, cause you, every time you're like, oh, they're gonna be happy, like, they're, 
you know, they've gone over this horrible thing and they're get doing better mm -hmm. and, the, you know, and then this time, like, oh, and they've come out to his <laughs> family and they've had they go through, through, they go through that, oh, the yeah. kidnapping, not even just they the They go through all this kidnapping. horrible, stupid shit <laughs> and then at the end, like, in the epilogue, they adopt a daughter uh -huh. and, like, raise her together and it's like, fuck, it's so beautiful. Love is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> And I have, like, yeah, this is one of those, like, super long shots that I never expected we would ever, ever get in mm -hmm. English. And I'm just so bowled over to have it. <laughs> Warts and all. Um, and I will treasure it in my collection for years to come. <laughs> and um, it's my number one for the year. Um Leave your comments below. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. end. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, mm. It's New York, New York is such a interesting piece of like cultural history um, for what it represented at the time it came out in Japan. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's but also again, I feel like it's one of those things that if you're one of those people who are like, I just want to have, you know, I just want to read about gay people without having to like double check that it fits all the fucking like perfect representation <laughs> purity standards of X, Y, Z. I just want something messy and like crazy and just still just and being pulpy. pulpy, but still about people being in love with other people. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to like, you know, pass the scrutiny of, of modern standards. Then this is the series for you. Yeah. And all of you should buy it. Um, and infinitesimally increase my chances of getting Kaze Toki no Uta in English someday. I mean, you can... The hill I will die on. <laughs> Keep petitioning, Ray. Keep petitioning, it'll happen. I will. Or Zankoku no Kami ga Shihai Suru, which is also from the 90s. Fight me. <laughs> anyway, um... Shall we finish off with the true number one of the year for all of us? G, what is your number one? My number one should be literally no surprise to anyone who has ever heard one minute of this podcast in the past. Um, or seen one, one second of one post from Twitter. If you know me, if you know ray if you know the podcast if you know everything that we've ever done and what we're about <laughs> you should know that my number one for this year was shona note boy soprano by yuki kamatani um Ooh, holy, shona no. ah! holy shit um so this is it happened it happened i can't believe <laughs> it, it happened, happened. This is one that, <laughs> for long-time listeners, you guys will know. For new listeners, you may not. Um, this was sort of a long shot for us in personal licensing. Uh, it had a better chance just mm -hmm. because of our dreams at dusk and the popularity of that. But mm -hmm. this is a different style of story. Um, and Yuki Kamatani's work hasn't always inherently been popular. Nabara no O, whilst beloved, is not like, a, was never a smash hit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In, in the before times, before this was licensed, <laughs> a eight or nine volume manga about a male soprano singer from... In a middle you, school choir. In a middle school choir didn't seem like a safe choice for publishers. Despite being a proven creator uh, or mangaka in the West, despite um, Kamatani's stuff just being phenomenal, it wasn't one that we expected to ever get picked up. But, mm -hmm. despite it all, 
despite despite it despite all. it all, Karancha heard our prayers and probably the thirty seven seven C's license like monthly license requests that I put in every month. Um, <laughs> that there yeah and me <laughs> <laughs> that there is a market. There was interest in Shona Note. Um, as said, this is the story of a middle school boy, uh, well, a kid just starting middle school, who is just like the sweetest, most pure, lovely little thing, um, but he has <laughs> a phenomenal ability to hear, um, well, yeah, to, yeah. to hear sounds, he, um... hear tones. Yeah, he's very hypersensitive to sound. Mm -hmm. Um and uh with that like he it comes with you know a good side and a bad side because he struggles a lot with sensory overload as well mm -hmm. um yeah and obviously due to this um he he really loves he attaches himself to sounds that he really enjoys um and loves and so it was very naturally drawn to music and more specifically vocal choir music um and so when he decides to transfer to the school or start at this new school he ends up after hearing a performance at the like entry well after hearing them practicing before he even started there but after hearing the performance at the like welcome to the new school year opening assembly He's like, I will join. Let me join you. Um, and they are very happy to bring him on because they need, they're like, yes, we definitely need new, more boys. Um, but lo and behold, he is a soprano, not a tenor or, or a bass, baritone, anything like that, uh, which not a lot of 12-year-old boys tend to be um, anyway. But mm -hmm. uh, he has just this beautiful clear pure un unaltered soprano um and because of that he, he, not only is he a great talent and, and a great you know addition to the choir but he's also noticed by others as, including adults as to having this having this incredible gift but as we all know once boys hit a certain age their voices tend to change and so this beautiful soprano may not last much longer so there is conflict in which they are trying to i don't know get him to perform get him to be the best soprano he can be whilst he is still a, a soprano um mm -hmm. it is I've only read this one volume. I know Ray has read most, if not all, of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, those noises are my review um, that Ray was just making. It is, <laughs> it's so good. Like, I don't, I don't think we really need to convince people that Yuki Kamatani is a phenomenal writer and in, in beyond incredible artist. Um, the amount of just beautiful visual metaphor that is always put into their work, the care that all of these characters are constructed with, um, mm -hmm. and the insecurities of this time in, in these characters' lives, not just with like, oh, the realities of puberty, but just the, the ongoing, just the stresses of being a person, but especially being the, the stresses of being a preteen and early teen, going through all of that so messy. Mm -hmm. Um and friendships and like the transience of it. Mm -hmm. The friendships, yeah. the building you know, relationships with each other. Right now this choir isn't very cohesive. Um there's a lot of clashing personalities. They are still trying to get more kids especially boys to join so they have a more diverse mm -hmm. and rich sound um mm -hmm. and as a choir kid myself i just i don't know there's ah uh, yes indeed uh, <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i just i promise you like this 
volume is mostly setting up um, Yutaka's character. He's the main character. Mm -hmm. But it's also setting the groundwork for um, what are going to be individual arcs Mm -hmm. for like Betsuyaku, the club president, Machia, Issei, Mm -hmm. uh, Tomo, and um, like so many other characters. They're all... uh, They're all my precious kids. And... Like, you get the whole, like, sports manga, like, because they're in a club, they're Mm going to try to, like, go for this competition, and that's going to be so many tears and cheers, and, um, yeah, (laughs) uh, and for people who are fans of Our Dreams at Dusk, this is not, like, an explicitly LGBT manga in the way that Our Dreams at Dusk is. Um, but it does feature LGBTQ representation, including non-binary representation, um, for those who are looking for that from this creator. Um, it's not like a main focus, but it is there. Which is, um, which is just come to be expected for Kamatani's work. Nabarno knows exactly mm-hmm. the same. Um, yeah, Hirayath as yeah, well. So it's, you know, the, the, this is a creator who has always had a lot of um, diversity within their characters and their relationships with each other and their, you know, gender or sexual expression. I know I've seen, like, expressed uh, concern expressed from a few different people um, just hearing the premise of this Mm -hmm. and how, like, gender essentialist it sounds um, at first glance that it's so focused on, like, you know, a young boy's vocal tone changing mm-hmm. as he reaches puberty. Um, but it's it's not handled in a gender essentialist way at all. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, it, it's a fact of the puberty that some people go through. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, Yutaka is not, you know, he's he's not, like, trans or anything. He doesn't experience, like, he does experience a kind of dysphoria related to his voice changing but we do also see like specifically gender dysphoria Mm -hmm. addressed related to voice changes with other characters within the series so like there are angles to this and i don't think that that should be a cause for concern Mm -hmm. which again is kind of like if you've read yuki kamatani's work um i feel like you probably know not to be concerned Mm -hmm. but if you haven't if this is the first one you're going into by them don't be concerned. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean. Also, we only get just a glimpse in the last couple yes. of pages, but gee, you're going to love Vlad so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was going to say. It, He's a little Yurio. Yeah, our, our little Yurio, our little Yurio opera singer. Um, <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm brimming with excitement that G can finally share this series with me. (laughs) (laughs) This is a series, uh, also just like outside of the quality of the actual, of Kamatani, because Kamatani is always phenomenal, we know this. Um, This is a really lovely book from Kodansha, it's a larger trim size, it's got Mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful lettering, um, fantastic translation. Yes. Yeah. I was so worried. The lettering in the series is so important in the Japanese, mm-hmm. and they've done a great job so far of retaining it. Um, both, like, they keep the Japanese, which uh, I know is going to be, like, a sticking point for some people, but I kind of like it. Mm-hmm. That they also lettered the translation of the sound effects, and the speech bubbles in a way to mimic the Japanese. Mm-hmm. So you have the bilingual there. And I think it's a really, they do a good job of, uh, yeah, adapting that. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic first volume of what I am only assured is a fantastic series all up. <laughs> um, if you are a fan of Yuki Kamatani, if you're a fan of, stories about i don't know middle schoolers if you're a fan of music and music focused stories um or this these stories about like the transience of youth especially early puberty 
Mm-hmm. Um, Check. Especially, it out. like, through the lens of, like, school clubs. Mm-hmm. So if you like series like Chihaya Fudu or Haikyuu, uh-huh. um, I think this will be up your alley as well. Quit calling me out like this, Ray. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> this is what I've been this is what I've been wanting to share with you, G. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now I can. And now we can <laughs> to all of our listeners who uh, haven't jumped tried it yet, because what are you doing? Try it. it go. Go buy volume one. Do it. <laughs> Do it right now. It's... If you need, if you need more convincing, um, I, I mentioned it before, but we did an entire podcast episode on Yuki Kamazani yes. to try and convince you, <laughs> <laughs> where I do talk about Shonen Note extensively. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, it it is by far and away, and I've been talking about some fantastic series that we've seen this year Shonen Note was my Mm -hmm. number one most highly anticipated and it absolutely Mm -hmm. and my my expectations were astronomical and it still exceeded expectations which always seems to be the case with Kamatani's work um it's (laughs) <laughs> the, again, with these lists, there's very, very rarely that there's one, like, my top five are pretty interchangeable, I don't have it strictly in any list, but this is, or any position within the list, this is number one for me, I know for Ray, hopefully for a lot of you listeners mm-hmm. out there um, who've given it a chance, I just, yeah, I don't... It, it wasn't even a question whether this would be included in the podcast on this yearly reflection. Yeah. The only question was which of us would get it. And it was getting <laughs> close to a fight to the death, I gotta tell you. Um, no, not at all. <laughs> but it, it is... The only reason that I gave it to G so easily is because she let me have our dreams with us. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you pay it forward. Um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what a wonderful way to cap off just a wonderful year of manga. Mm -hmm. We've had so many fantastic series, some that we mentioned both in our lists and in our honorable mentions, but also many that our listeners have also listed. There's just been, as we said at the beginning, so many, so many new books. And plenty of those mm-hmm. weren't ever going to make it onto a list like this. But there are already also mm-hmm. so many that deserve to be on longer lists. Um, there's just it's just so much. We don't we can't so much. We can't, so much. We can't be here for five. Well, I say five hours. We're over three. We can't be here for ten we're here hours. For three. <laughs> I know. If we. If sat down and talked about every single amazing book or or great, good, fantastic, interesting, exciting, wonderful, heart wrenching, whatever it is, series that was released in English for twenty twenty two, we'd be halfway through twenty twenty three before we got to the end of it. Um <laughs> it's it's just such an interesting context to where the market is to how how manga is being released in how like what kind of manga is being released the diversification of the market again we talk about this every year but we are in such a unique and wonderful position as manga fans in this current age um because, yeah, t- 10 years ago, we wouldn't be getting New York, New York. We wouldn't be getting shown a note. We we might not <laughs> even be getting something like 
well, we definitely wouldn't be getting any of the classic horror, but we wouldn't even have gotten anything, something like Lost Lad London, which is a little bit more of a safe, quote unquote mm-hmm. safe bet. It's just such a wonderful thing to be able to participate in a community um, that just has something for everyone. And uh, as always, if mm. if we didn't mention your favorite for the year um, in this podcast, it's not that it's bad. It's not that it's not that even inherently we didn't like it. It's just that there's just been so much. Um, and the great thing about- and feel free to tell us all about it in the comments below if you're on YouTube yes or on Twitter yes it's because there's just so many uh, and these are just the debuts right like the amount of ongoing series mm-hmm. that are just a- 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 amazing incredible, incredible yeah. <laughs> beyond compare uh, mm-hmm. yeah um I've had or I don't know about you, Ray, but there's been several series that have finished this year that have just been mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, yeah. Well, I talked about two of them. Yeah, so. and I talked about <laughs> one of them. Um, but there's there's just so much manga. Um, and before we wrap up, I think just to to look to the future, Ray... I, I'm putting you on the spot mm-hmm. here, but of our of oh, our gosh. 2023 um, new releases of our licenses that we know mm-hmm. are being are hopefully coming out within the next year, what's what is what is your your hopefuls your excitement? I literally don't remember anything that's coming out next year. <laughs> anything. <laughs> I mean that's also fair because we get new we get things announced like every two weeks every week really. Um, yeah, I'm not a pre-order person. I'm too chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah, which is absolutely fair. Um, I know. Well, yeah. I, what about you, G? I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, do not say mystery. Do not call me mystery. Whatever that. Ah is. yes, that's coming yes. out. Yes. Uh, it's been haunting me in Japanese bookstores like the whole time I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I need to finally find out what that one is about. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery, presumably. Um, I'm looking forward to the Fuji- presumably pr- the Fujimoto short story collections, um, which we mentioned previously. Um, I am looking forward to uh, Innocent. That was a surprise license. Mm. Um, yeah. thanks Dark Horse <laughs> I never would have expected that um, hopefully fingers crossed we see the new edition of They Were Eleven next year from Denpa mm-hmm. I didn't remember if that um, had just moved to 2023 or if it had already been delayed until 2024 <laughs> yeah I don't know um, I'm also um, uh, speaking of Dempa, I'm hoping that we do finally get that first volume of March Comes in Like a Lion, um, because that mm-hmm. that's that's one that I'm looking forward to, and I can't even tell you what I'm looking forward to from Seven Seas because there's just more than I <laughs> could any human could remember, and with that. We come to the end of our episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for spending another year with Ray and I um, as we head into 2023. As always, you can find these podcast episodes not only on my YouTube channel, Simply G, but across pretty much every podcasting platform. Um, The major ones, at least Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, those sorts of things. Stitcher is another one. Anchor FM. You have your choice of platforms. (laughs) And as long... uh, So far, Twitter hasn't entirely imploded on itself. So if you are wanting to follow me there, you can do so um, with um, at... G reads, that's G G W E underscore reads. And be sure to follow Ray at her Twitter, 
at Whimsical Picks, that's P I X, and check out her YouTube channel, Whimsical Pictures. Yes, it is death, <laughs> but <laughs> it might be revived at any time. I like to keep people on their toes. <laughs> yeah, mm. <laughs> yes. So. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I as for next month's episode, we I'll reveal that a little bit closer to um, to recording. So we always yes. welcome your questions, your comments, your opinions. Let us know what you think about the podcast and what you think about any of any of the books that we talk about or creators we've talked about. Um, and have a wonderful rest of the year, a wonderful Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you may celebrate, and a fabulous new year, regardless. Um, yes. See you next year. <laughs> see you in 2023. Bye, guys. Bye.